Thank you, Sinead, and thanks to, to DCD for the hospitality. Uh, when you look at uh, these little symbols here, usually you don't pay much attention. But on this particular occasion, uh, it's very much of the life history of our speaker, uh, who comes from, from Italy and uh, has lived close to the coast, both in, uh, where he, he made his first steps in, in Bari and then quickly uh, close to uh, Trieste at, at Sisa. And he just told me that uh, uh, this symbol over there, Ulysses crossing the waves, Immensum Peracramus, is not only uh, the, uh, the symbol of Dias, uh, but, but also of, of Sisa, a place uh, where he got his laurea and uh, then uh, uh, the PhD. So uh, he, he always has been attracted uh, to the sea uh, in various ways, also to the, to the infinite sea. You, you uh, go to, uh, to the universe. Uh, but after uh, getting his laurea, he uh, was uh, snatched by uh, the Italian army. And like in the 18th century, what does the army do if uh, they have an astronomer? They put him into the Navy. Uh, except that, uh, that nowadays he, he got into a submarine. And, uh, it's a bit more indirect, I think, when you position the subspace. So, so uh, maybe that was not completely useless for, for later careers. But anyhow, uh, he got attached to the seas, and, and last month he has been crossing the Atlantic sailing. So, uh, well, uh, of course, he has been to the States before, so five years postdoc uh, experience. Uh, then he moved back uh, to Italy, uh, became uh, the director of the uh, computational part of, of CISA. <laughs> and uh, uh, got a lot of, of international attention and uh, was hired by the Einstein Institute, Max Planck Institute uh, in Germany, where still has some connection and uh, then obtained uh, a position at, at Goethe University uh, where he is the director of uh, theoretical physics at the time. And uh, well, about activities you see here, uh, Black Hole CAM. Uh, this is a Synergy ERC grant uh, of 14 million and was the first such grant uh, given to, to astrophysics. So uh, what uh, they, they want to do is uh, to take nice images of the big black hole at the center of our galaxy. So he is an expert <coughs> on black holes, but uh, this is not uh, the, the topic of today. Uh, the, the topic is, is neutron stars, which in a way is even more interesting. So. Thank you very much, Werner, for the kind uh, description and for you all to be here. Um, indeed, I, I recognize myself very much into, into that little logo there, and I do feel a strong attachment to other dynamics, and uh, you know, for sailing you do need fluids both to, f you know, in terms of something to float on and something that pushes you forth. So, as the title goes, uh, I will not be talking about black hole cam because, as Venner was mentioning, with black hole cam we want to take an image of the black hole, and we haven't done that yet. So maybe the next time I'm here, I'll be able to show you this picture and, and, and convince you that there is a black hole at the center of the galaxy. For the time being, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about something which is less controversial, and that is merging neutron stars. Here is what I would like to, to tell you about. I will tell you about the irresistible attraction of gravity. You know all that uh, gravity attracts, and I'll try to explain why, in my view, it attracts. Um, I will tell you about the beauty and the challenges that come with uh, general relativity, which is Einstein's theory of gravity. And I will tell you how um, neutral stars, in many respects, represent Einstein's richest laboratory. Of course, he didn't know about the existence of neutron stars, and, and he would probably be very amused by the existence of such objects. And I will tell you then about the mergers, what happens if you have two of such stars merging, and how they produce a number of interesting phenomena, like gravitational waves, gamma reverses, and nuclear synthesis. 
So let's first talk about gravity. Okay. Well, as it happens, we have a multiple experience with gravity, we, or, or a multiple level of notion of gravity. First of all, we have an instinctive notion. If you ever held a small baby, few, even a few hours old, you would know that he has a reflex. It's called a moral reflex, and is is a reaction to changes in gravitational uh, accelerations. That's what he does. As soon as you try to drop him, he will try to grab onto whatever he can. This is a reflex. And this is, if you think about it, it's very strange, because this baby was swimming in a womb for, for nine months, and, and yet already had a knowledge about gravity. This knowledge goes on into our understanding and intuition about what gravity does to us. Right? If you think about what this guy is experiencing, you know exactly what is going to happen a, a, a second later. And this is because our brain somehow is able to, to, uh, to take into account gravitational acceleration and all of our movements that you know, are so difficult to instruct a, a machine are actually very, very, very instinctive for us. So going down the stairs in, in, in a rush is something that, that is very difficult to program algorithmically and yet it's our brain can do very easily even when we are a few months old. And then there is the imaginative part of gravity. Somehow gravity really does attract our attention. And, and this is a movie that was out a few years ago, probably you've all seen this, and uh, this one, this movie won all the records uh, in, in, uh, over the weekend uh, tickets selling. Um, and I think it's because, again, gravity is such a, such a, a polarizing ob subject. So let's see what are the fathers of gravity. There is, certainly the first father is, is uh, Isaac Newton. In 1679, he, he came out with his theory of gravity. He said, gravity is a force acting between two bodies of a given mass, and one or little m and big m, something like so. And um, this force is inversely proportional to the distance and the square of this distance in particular. And the expression for this force is, is given here. And with this simple expression, he could explain essentially all of the astronomical observation of his time. And with this, with this very simple expression, we can build this building, or we can build a car, or we can build whatever has to do with gravity on our planet. But then, you know, problems started to, to come up, and it was obvious that actually as the observation became more and more accurate, that this, this law doesn't, doesn't really explain everything. But, uh, it can explain everything, but then you need to come up with very complicated explanation to um, explain, for instance, why Mercury trajectory, Mercury uh, orbit, is precessing. And so in, in his attempt to describe gravity, um, Einstein came in 1915, so 100 years ago, with this with theory, uh, the theory of general relativity, Algebraic relativity theory, and uh, it completely changes the, the picture. It says, forget about forces. There is no such concept as forces. Gravity is just a manifestation of curvature, of space-time curvature. He had already introduced the concept of space-time, and then he, he goes over and says that space-time actually can be curved, and if it is curved, then this will manifest itself into, into gravity. So the fact that if I drop this pointer, it will fall, is, is not because there is a force, but just because the space-time around a pointer is curved. And one of the implications of, of this view is that you, you produce objects that, of course, he didn't know about, and, and, and uh, uh, some of which he even doubted, like gravitational waves, for some time. But these are obvious consequences of this theory. So let's go back very briefly about what are the Einstein's equations, so that we can grasp a little bit what is the significance of this theory. They're written there, and I don't expect you to appreciate much, apart from the fact that there is an equal sign. Okay? I guess that would be easy to appreciate. There is an equal sign saying there is, there is an equality between whatever is on the left and whatever is on the right. Let me tell you what is on the, on the left and on the right. On the left there is the Einstein tensor, and on the right there is the energy momentum tensor. Okay, maybe this doesn't tell you much. So imagine that on the left there is space-time curve. There is a measure, you know, you don't need to know how, but that measure is a measure of space-time curvature. And on the right-hand side there is a measure of the content of energy and mass so what he's saying is that there is an equivalence between curvature on the left-hand side and mass energy. So gravity 
is just a manifestation, gravity is, uh, is a manifestation of, of, such, of such curvature. Now, whenever I get to this point of my explanation, I, I know that I haven't e really explained much, and so let me try and come up with some, some uh, better explanation of what is space-time curvature. So suppose that you have a rubber sheet, or you know, a sheet of your bed, which is completely empty of any object and, and is perfect, perfectly flat. Um, I think we can, we, we, we're familiar with this concept, and we can say that this sheet, or this surface, is flat. Space-time associated with it, I would say, is flat. Now suppose you place an object, um, we know what happens. The sheet will no longer be flat, will respond to this, to this deformation, and we'll have some, some, some depth. And I would say, mathematically, that's a manifestation of curvature. I don't need to explain how I can measure curvature, but there are mathematical tools that allow me to measure how curved you know, that dent is. And now, if you want to contrast the gravitational interpretation of, uh, well, the interpretation of Newton of, of what gravity is, then he, what he says is that you have an object m and a little object little m, and there's going to be a force, and the only way to uh, prevent the gravitational force forcing the little m to fall onto the big M is by creating an alternative force, a, a, a counterbalancing force, which is the centrifugal force. So this object has to rotate. And that's what describes the motion of a planet around a star. What Einstein is saying is that forget about forces. Really, what is happening is that the big object is curving space-time, the little object is feeling this curvature, it wants to fall because that's the only thing it can do if there is a non-flat surface. And so the only way in which it can do is by moving on this surface, which is curved, and rotate. So it's the same picture, okay? At the end of the day, what you have is a little object here going around a big object. And it's a matter of how you interpret what, 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 you know, what's behind. And of course, we know that this is wrong, <coughs> and then we know that it is right for a number of reasons, experimental reasons. So it's not a matter of you know of ideology here. We know that this is producing the right interpretation of results. So if you want an, a, a, a mechanical analogy which doesn't involve planets, you know, just think about a roulette. A roulette is pretty much the same. There's going to be a curved surface which is the one towards which the little ball will fall in, and in order to avoid falling in that, it has to spin in a given. If it doesn't spin, because the, the table is, is, is slowing down, then the only thing we can do is go and follow the curvature of that surface. Okay, now, um, I said that black holes, neutron stars, and gravitational waves are, are, are um, features of, the, of Einstein's gravity, and they have two important components which are similar. One of them is that they have high curvature. I'll explain what is curvature. And the other one is that they move near the speed of light. Now, if you want to know what is the curvature, and you want a simple estimate of what is the curvature, suppose you want to ask yourself when you weigh yourself on the, on, 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 to, to check your weight, well, what is my curvature? You can easily do this. All you have to do is take your mass, whatever, in kilograms, calculate what is your typical size, let me call it R, and then you get a number. In, 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 this is a, a dimensionless number in, in proper units, and that will tell you the amount of curvature. You will find out that you are not very curved, um, but it's okay. It's a number you can calculate. And in fact, you can calculate this number. So m over r is a dimensionless number, and you can calculate this for a number of objects. And in particular, you can calculate it for black holes or neutron stars or gravitational waves. And um, because of this problem, because they are highly compact and they move at the speed of light, they are very hard to study. Um, and the reason is that if you want to study these objects, you need to solve the Einstein's equations. And if you are, have also neutron star, then in addition to the Einstein's equation, we will have to solve also other equations. Those are, for instance, of relativistic other dynamics, or even magneto other dynamics, MHD. So uh, I'm sure if you're a mathematician, well, we if you're a physicist, you can only be in love by, these, by the beauty of these equations. So these are the equations that I was showing before, the Einstein's field equations, and these are the equations that need to be complemented if you want to study stars. 
And this equation looks very, very nice and very elegant and very simple, but then that's because they are written in a way which is misleading. If you try to solve it, that's what they would look like. <laughs> okay? So that's when reality really kicks in, and when you want to do some calculation, you have to, you know, you have that those nice equations look like that. And, um, and so if you want, Einstein's theory is as beautiful as it is intractable analytically. Pen and paper will not take you very far. You can derive some analytic expressions for situations which have symmetries, you know, they have particular simplifications. But if you want to study a binary system, which is really you know, the most exciting uh, system, then, then you really have to go into numerical relativity. That's when the superheroes come and, and save uh, the game. So what does numerical relativity do? Essentially, it wants to solve the Einstein's equations and those of relativistic aerodynamics in all of those regimes where one expects that any other approach will just fail or will not be accurate enough. And in order to do this, inevitably, you need supercomputers. Because it's just through supercomputing that you have the computational power to do the sum of the things that I will, I will show later today. So let's start with neutron stars. Um, what is a neutron star? Well, uh, it's the end point is over here, uh, is the end point of the evolution of the life of a massive star. So a star which has a mass between 10 and 100 solar masses um, will end up you know, uh, following this type of um, sequence, uh, becoming first a red supergiant and then a supernova into a neutron star. So it's, the, 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 a neutron star is whatever is left after a supernova explosion. It's a very small core of what has not been blown out by uh, the supernova. Actually, it's the source of the supernova. It's just the shock produced by the formation of the, of the neutron star that blows up the star. And there is a beautiful example that I can show about what is a, a neutron star. So as it happens, about a thousand years ago, in 1054 uh, before Christ, uh, after Christ, sorry, um, Chinese astronomers could see already in daylight a new star appearing in the sky. And uh, this, this star then disappeared after a few months, and we now know that there, is, that there was a supernova explosion that they had detected. And, and because it was in the constellation of the crab, uh, it is called a crab uh, pulsar. It's a pulsar, so it's, it's a source of radio, a, a regular source of radio waves. And you can see some of the images of this object in the optical, or in the infrared, or in the X-ray, and in the radio. So what you have at the very center, so this is essentially whatever is left over of the, of the uh, supernova explosion. It's, it's still moving out, this, this material, but at the very center there, there is this very um, intense and small object that is producing the, all of this, of this interesting emission. And for many reasons, neutron stars are marvels of nature. Let me give you some examples. So I've printed this out of Google. This is a map of Dublin. So this is Dublin. This is the airport. You can think that roughly in that volume, you can fit a neutron star. So you can fit an object which has a mass between 1.3 and 2 solar masses. So this is um, much, much larger than the mass of the, of the, of the Earth that has a radius of between 10 and 15 kilometers, and has a density which is 10 to the 15 gram per cubic centimeter. So that's 10,000 of billions more than the typical density of water. It's a huge density, so huge that if you take a little spoon of this matter, this is equivalent in, 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 in weight to the whole Mont Blanc. Another way of looking at it is that the gravitational field is a billion times larger than on Earth. So do not ever try and go on a neutral star. You would have a very hard time resisting as a human. You would be completely crushed by the huge gravitational field. In fact, the gravitational field is so strong that um, these objects are producing a very intense magnetic field, which is you know, 10 to the 12 Gauss, so again, 1,000 times thousand billion times larger than what is on Earth, and they rotate. This is most most amazing feature. They rotate, and they rotate so fast that effe effectively they are 
rotating at frequencies which is almost 700 Hz. So, one millisecond, less than one millisecond. Imagine a ball which is essentially spherical. In fact, they are the most spherical objects we know in nature. We can't produce anything as spherical as a neutron star that are rotating at a speed of uh, 700, at a frequency of 700 Hz. Now, you would think that all of this is, is, is nonsense, that this cannot exist. But, you know, what, what physics tells you that if it is possible, um, it is actually exist. You know, if it is allowed by the, 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 the equations, then it exists. And in fact, neutron stars exist. We observe thousands of them, and some of them have these very bizarre properties. If you want to have a, a, a graphical idea of how big uh, these objects are, and this will also help me make a comment, is take the sun, imagine that this is the surface of the sun, it's essentially a straight line in this plot, and this is the size of a wide world. This is a, the end point of the life of a star, which is not very massive. Um, the sun has a radius of about 70,000 kilometers, and you can calculate what is the compactness, so as I said, there is a measure of, of the uh, curvature, on the sun is of order 10 to the minus 6. So this is one part in a million. You can calculate, uh, you can compare a wide warp with a neutron star, and this is, would be the graphical representation of the difference in, in, in surface. And the wide warp is about 10,000 kilo, 10, kilometers, and the curvature is higher, it's of order 10 to the minus 4. So one part in 10 to the 4 in 10,000. Then you compare a neutron star with a black hole, and that's the kind of difference you have. As you can see, they are very comparable. In fact, when you come down, when it comes down to the compactness, um, the difference is very small. They both of order one half. So this is telling you that although black holes are by far the most, uh, the place where the most, the, the, the strongest gravitational fields are present, neutron stars are not far behind. And therefore, all of the properties, you know, if you know that, that black holes are requiring um, Einstein's theory to be described, then you, you convince yourself that in order to describe neutron star equally, you need Einstein's theory of gravity. So, um, to have an idea of what is the difference between uh, a neutron star and black hole, uh, we often represent uh, space-time curvature in terms of these embedded diagrams. These are ways of, you know, in the analogy of the, of the curved, um, of the curved surface and, and uh, the, of the sheet I was referring to, you can imagine that uh, a black hole is uh, an object like so. It has a, an infinitely uh, strong uh, curvature, you know, the, 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 the weight is so high that the, the sheet is completely curved. The white line here marks the position of the horizon. The horizon is, a, is, is, is not a surface. Is a mathematical surface, not a hard surface. While this is the equivalent representation of a neutron star. So they are extremely similar, um, especially in the parts which are outside of, of the surface of the star. In fact, the space time outside of a neutron star is identical as that of a black hole. And uh, so the important difference is that neutron stars have a hard surface, just like, you know the surface of, 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 of our planet, while black holes do not have a surface. And another important difference is that the curvature is finite, it's very large, but finite in a neutron star, while it can become infinite at the very center of the black hole. Apart from those, they are very similar. So, neutron stars, the very special object I was describing before, is often seen in binary systems. And, um, so if one is already exceptional, just think about how exceptional is to have two of such objects in, in, in the same system. And um, if you want to study what is the dynamics of this binary system, again, you can compare Einstein versus Newton. Newton would say, well, you know, just use my expression for the force, balance it with the, with the centrifugal force, you will obtain an expression for the distance at which your system is in equilibrium. And uh, so this is just a you have closed orbits, the two systems will be on these orbits forever. Einstein's theory says, no, this is not, not possible. Um, this is not possible because the system is, uh, is losing energy, an angular momentum, through the emission of gravitational waves. 
what are gravitational waves? Well, let's go back to the example of the, of the sheet or the flat sheet and then uh, of a weight put on the, uh, on the sheet. Now imagine instead of having one weight, you have two weights, okay? Then you have two dents. That's easy to imagine. Now imagine that you have these two weights rotate around each other. You can imagine easily that the dents will just follow the motion of these two objects, right? And you can easily imagine that when this happens, there are going to be small ripples produced by the motion, the ripples on the sheet that will propagate out at the edges of the sheet. These are just the fact that, that uh, the, the two dents are moving all the time and they are therefore producing perturbations and these will propagate. So these are gravitational waves. Our perturbations produced by the fact that the curvature is not static but is actually moving around. And when they move, they take away energy. And because the system is losing energy, uh, the system is getting closer and closer to each other. So in a binary system, uh, the emission of gravitational waves deprives the system of energy and, and, it, and induces the system to, uh, to shrink. Now, a binary system is also one made by the Earth and the Moon. So now you may, you may start worrying yourself that if what I said is just right, then the Earth and the Moon are getting closer and closer, and at what point the Moon will just collide with the, with the Earth. Well, that's exactly correct. What is, what is important to underline, though, is that for this emission to be efficient, to be uh, produce large amplitude waves, you need motions near the speed of light. The Earth and, and the Moon are moving relative to each other with very small velocities. So the amount of energy which is lost because of the orbital motion is very small. And so it's going to take billions of years before the Moon actually falls onto the Earth. However, there are systems where this is not true. In a binary system of neutron stars, you can measure the decay of the orbit through you know, observation that lasts even a few days. You can take some of these binary systems of neutron stars, observe that they measure their distance, go and measure it a few days later, and they will be at a closer distance. And this is because they are emitting gravitational waves. So these are prime targets for detectors of gravitational waves. Now, what happens when these objects um, tend to become closer and closer? It's a runaway process, and let me explain you why. If the system is moving at a given frequency, it is emitting a certain amount of energy. But the amount of energy increases as the system becomes closer, as it did the separation becomes smaller. The frequency of rotation becomes higher, and so the system is losing even more energy, and so is, is spinning up even faster, and this is a runaway process. So that at the end, a binary system of a neutron star or a binary system of black holes will spend most of its life orbiting around each other at a very low and slow pace, and then at the end will pick up in frequency and uh, you know, emerge very rapidly. It's a bit like having two dancers. At the beginning they are far apart and they are dancing very slowly, but then as they continue to dance and they get closer, the rhythm of the music uh, goes up, and at one point all of this uh, leads to a merge. If you take two black holes, they, they are made of nothing, they are made of vacuum. They are just space-time curvatures. When you, when you merge them, you produce another black hole and gravitational wave. So, this is a two, what is called a two-body problem in general relativity. You take two objects, you let them coalesce, and, and you study what happens. In the case of binary black holes, you start from two black holes and you end up with another black hole plus gravitational waves. If you're dealing with neutron star, the system is a bit more complicated. Eventually, you do produce a black hole. But in between, um, there's going to be some intermediate stages which are very interesting. The first one is that when two stars merge, they don't produce immediately a black hole. Most likely, they produce an object which is called a hypermassive neutron star, or HMNS. This is an object which you can't produce in nature through slow, quasi-stationary transformations. 
but you can produce in a, in a catastrophic event. You take two objects, you just smash them against each other, and then you can produce this object which will stay in equilibrium for a short period of time up until something will drive it to collapse to a black hole. So when the other mass neutron star collapses, a black hole is produced, and normally this black hole will be surrounded by some matter, which is what we call a torus. The torus is there not forever, it's going to be a credion to the black hole, and at the end you will end up with a black hole in vacuum. So the sequence is you take two stars, you will end up with a black hole, but it's just eventually. Now, we don't really understand a lot about these stages, particularly this part and this part over here, but this is where all the difficulties, but also all the rewards are. In particular, if we can understand this, and I will show you how, maybe we are in a way of understanding what neutron stars are made of. Sorry, I didn't mention this. We don't know what neutron stars are made of. All I told you is that they have a certain mass, and they have a roughly a certain radius. But if you ask me, well, what is it at, at, at a given position in the star? We don't know. Or better, we have many different answers and we don't know which one is the right one. And this is given by the multiplicity of these lines. These are all called equations of state. This is what nuclear physicists think uh, uh, neutron stars are made of. And as you can see, there are as many answers as there are nuclear physicists. So <laughs> clearly, this is not a solution to the problem. Another way to, um, you know, difficulty here is that, you know, maybe if we understand what happens in this stage when there is a black hole in the torus, maybe we understand what, what produces gamma ray bursts. I will have the opportunity to say a bit more about gamma ray bursts, but these are fantastic energetic explosions that we see essentially every day. And last but not least, um, in, during this process, some of the matter is ejected. You know, it's, it's not, it's not difficult to imagine if you take two objects which are very compact and you smash them at a close to the speed of light you're going to produce a lot of mess around and this is this matter is so energetic that it just leaves the system and uh, when it leaves the system it undergoes nuclear reactions and produces elements in particular gold we think that essentially all of the gold in the universe is produced through this process so it's not clear that coins are producing this process, but certainly gold are going to be producing this process. What I'm going to show you now is the result of a numerical calculation. So I've taken those equations, the very equation that I've shown you in that slide, and I've solved them in the very same supercomputer I was showing in the picture. And what happens is something like so. So you have, this is you have the two neutron stars which are described as uh, made of a, a fluid of a given equation of state. They will orbit around each other, they will deform tidally each other, and they're getting closer. And they, as they get closer, at one point they will merge. So they are emitting gravitational waves. You don't see the gravitational waves, but they are emitting gravitational waves. Then you produce this object, which is the upper massive neutron star I was mentioning, and this is an unstable object. It's losing angular momentum, and it's spinning faster and faster, up until at one point when it becomes so compact that an horizon will be formed and a black hole will be formed. And so you produce this torus, um, very dense torus, which you, you, know, you may uh, not appreciate from this animation, but the density here is still very high, <coughs> billions of times larger than the one on Earth, and it's very hot. Now, this is not, let me stress it again, it's not a computer graphics animation. This is the result of self-consistent solutions of the Einstein's equations and those of relativistic aerodynamics. And this sequence I was mentioning, you have a merger, you have an upper massive neutron star, and you have a black hole plus torus. This is a very robust sequence. No matter how sophisticated or how many variants you put in your picture, this is always true. You produce first a merger, then you produce an intermediate object, and then at the end this object produces a black hole. <coughs> so let me give you some of the degrees of freedom, some of the variants of this picture. The first one is given by the mass. So in this funny diagram, I'll try to represent the various possibilities. It's a funny diagram because I'm plotting time on the x-axis, and it's really a, co a, 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 a collage of different time instance. And, uh, and I'm putting here on the y-axis the, um, the mass of the system normalized to the maximum mass 
that the neutron star can, can, can support. So this is a concept that I failed to, to remark. You can't produce neutron stars of arbitrary mass. I've said it, we know that there are between 1.3 and 2 solar masses. This is because if you try to make a neutron star too heavy, it will collapse to a black hole. Gravity at one point will just win in this, in this fight with, with the equations of state. And so we don't know lethal maximum mass, and that's why I, I haven't given you a number. And so the sequence of uh, the, the storyline, if you want, of this binary is that for millions of years, the, the binary just uh, orbits around it, the, each other, uh, emitting low amplitude, constant frequency gravitational waves, almost constant frequency. <coughs> then it will merge, use an upper mass neutron star, and then a black hole in the torus, and then eventually a black hole in the back. This is the picture I was trying to give you. Now, if the system instead has a very large mass to start with, then you, you kill one portion of the, of the storyline. You will not have an intermediate object. The two stars will just immediately merge and produce a black hole. Vice versa, if the system is not very massive, you will have something different. You, you might have the, the hypermass neutron star, which is differentially rotating, actually will become uniformly rotating. And maybe even non-rotating at all. You will produce a nice non-rotating neutron star. Or maybe a black hole. We don't know. So this is, this is the realm of possibilities of this picture. And this depends on what is the equation of state and what is exactly the mass of the system. But <coughs> in this diagram, you see you know, what are the possibilities of this system. You always start with a binary, and then you might end up either with a black hole immediately or with a black hole at one point. When I say well, at one point, I'm, I'm talking about a few hundred seconds at most. So this is not, you know. And the merger happens in, in a time scale of milliseconds anyway. Or maybe you will have a stable neutron star. Uh, so this is the degree of freedom of the total mass of the system. Another degree of freedom is the mass asymmetry. The calculation I've shown you was assuming that the two stars are exactly the same mass. But we know that this is a very good approximation, but it's not exact. Neutron stars do have slightly different masses. And what happens when you have slightly different masses? Well, you can, you can ask a computer code to calculate this, this hypothesis for you. So this system now has two different masses, two stars, which have a difference of about 20% in mass. There's going to be this guy, which is the more massive one, and is more compact. So follow the small guy, because he has the one that has much more mass, well, much more, 20% more mass. What he does is that he will strip apart its companion tidally. He will just break it apart. It will accrete all of its mass and will also create all of its angular momentum. And because of this, it will itself break apart, producing a very large torus. Okay? And um, the beauty of, of this numerical simulation is that you can actually you know, study them and, and, and navigate through the data so you can see what, what are the properties of the system. So this is what you would expect in the more general situation where the two stars do not have the same mass. One of them will destroy the other, producing a large torus SO. <coughs> so this is, uh, these tori are more massive, they are much more extended than if the, the masses are the same, and they are in quasi Keplerian orbits. That means that these objects can, can, can survive for much longer times. There are more degrees of freedom, more shades to this broad brush picture. One of them is the equation of state. Now, what is the equation of state? It is, as I was saying, the description of what neutron stars are made of. And normally, there, are, there is a simple way of distinguishing the equation of state, which is stiff or soft. Essentially, it is telling you whether or not you take a piece of, of neutron star matter and whether you can compress it a lot or not. If you cannot compress it a lot, you call it a stiff equation of state. If you can compress it a lot, then you call it a soft equation of state because the object can become very small. It's a soft material. Um, another another um, ingredient in this picture is magnetic fields. I haven't mentioned magnetic fields. Magnetic fields, as anything in astrophysics, has an important role. And then you have that when you, when you collide to neutron stars, you produce very large temperatures. And these large temperatures, together with large densities, will produce neutrinos. And neutrinos will produce 
losses, radiated losses, and this will be, will be needed to be taken into account. So these are all the basic uh, features that need to be taken into account when you want to model binary neutron stars. Let me tell you how we could use um, gravitational waves from neutron star to model the equation of state. So, first of all, let me remind you that we have seen binary neutron stars merge. This is something that has been uh, announced in October last of this year, and what they've seen is this, is this uh, signal. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with reading this type of diagrams, but here you have time in seconds, and this is the frequency of the signal. And the frequency, you see, there is a nice track here. This, it is a signal that is increasing in frequency. I'll show you this, this signal in a minute. Um, this system was seen to have a mass of 2.74 solar mass, the total mass of the system, and the single mass is where it seems to be between 1.36 and 1.6 for the first one, for the more massive, and 1.117 and 1.36 for the second. So, these are ballpark the type of masses that we were expecting, and as I was telling you, there is about a 10-20% difference in mass. So, this is a, a very short introduction to gravitational waveforms. This is a binary black hole waveform, and it's the simplest you can come up with. It's a very old waveform that I computed more than 10 years ago, um, when I was looking at these type of things, and um, I can tell you what you can see. There is a first part which is in spiral, so the amplitude of the system is almost constant. Then there is a chirp. You see the chirp is characterized by an increasing frequency and increasing in, in amplitude. And then there is a ring down. When the two black holes merge and produce another black hole, this black hole is perturbed. It's like a bell. It's like, uh, exactly like a bell, which rings down exponentially fast, leaving a tail at all. And this is the <coughs> ring down of the black hole. In a binary neutron star system, the same <coughs> process that was mentioned before, merger, uh, hypermass neutron star, produces this type of waveforms. So again, you can see there's going to be an in spiral, then it's going to be a transient, then there's going to be the hypermass neutron star, which is essentially a bar deformed object, which is spinning, and is producing an almost constant gravitational wave signal, and then at one point, this will collapse and will produce a black hole. So the different parts are here. You have a chirp signal, you have the post-merger, and you have a black hole formation <coughs> and ring down. So now you know all you need to know about gravitational waves from, from neutron star. But which one is the right waveform? Which one is the right equation of state? You want to know this because what you can measure is a mass but you would like to know also what is the radius. In order to do this, in order to go from mass to radius, you need to have an equation of state. And, um, okay, so be before I go into that, let me just um, explain how the uh, signal would, um, <coughs> would interact with a, with a gravitational wave detector. It's shown in this uh, diagram. So here is the frequency, here is the spectral uh, power density, so it's the amount of energy at a given frequency. And a binary system which is in spiraling and merging will follow this track over here. We go from low frequency to high frequency, uh, decreasing in, in spectral density. Uh, concentrate on the, on the black line. This is a system of two black holes, each having 1.4 solar masses. So we don't think they exist. I'm just using them as a, as a reference. You see, it's a very simple signal which has a uh, and a little bump here because you have a, a, an increased amount of energy being released. And then you have a cutoff. This is the ring down. You get the spectral density goes exponentially fast. If you want to look at binary neutron stars, you see that um, they are essentially the same at large distances or low frequencies. This is because they behave essentially like black holes. And that's because black holes themselves behave essentially like point particles. But then as you go to higher frequency, or if you get closer to each other, neutron stars and black holes behave differently. Black holes are essentially rigid. Neutron stars can be deformed tidally, and this produces this difference between the black and the blue line. <coughs> then there is the merger, which happens at lower frequencies. And then you have this mess over here, these, these old wiggly lines. And this may look like a mess, but actually it contains a lot of information. 
And it's by looking at these lines over here, as I'll explain in a moment, that you can understand what is the equation of state. And there's been a lot of progress uh, worldwide, and in Frankfurt in particular, in trying to model these peaks over here. So this is the kind of things we can do nowadays. We can do binary mergers of many different equations of state and of many different, uh, and many different masses. So different colors are, a row is a given equation of state, and different columns are different masses. To compute these waveforms, we needed about one year of supercomputing time. So these are very expensive calculations, nevertheless. And, um, and I don't want to explain in the details of this, of this plot, but what you can imagine is take these, which are signals in time, and see what are the spectral properties. In other words, see what are the, the the frequency representation, the Fourier transform of these objects. And they would look like so. And again, I don't expect you to appreciate anything else but the fact that these are lines, they are peaks. And so, at least conceptually, these are not very different from emission or absorption lines in, in, uh, in stellar atmosphere. If you've ever studied astronomy, you may have learned that astronomy has become a science when people have recognized that by looking at the spectrum of the light emitted by, by stars, you could understand what the stars were made of, because different stars had different spectra. And this is shown here. Different neutron stars will produce objects with different spectra. So this is really gravitational wave spectroscopy. You look at spectra to appreciate and understand the properties of the system. Let me show you how you can, you can, you can do this in practice. This is a given waveform, um, the blue waveform, or the blue equation of state, whatever that is. There is the, the merger, which is a time equal zero, this is in milliseconds, and then there is the upper mass neutron star. You look at the frequency decomposition of the signal, there is this big signal over here, big peak F1, sorry, F2, and then F1, and then another one, which we call F3. You change the equation of state, you have a red line. It's a completely different waveform in frequency. But if you look at the spectrum, it still has these features. It has a high frequency peak, a low frequency peak, and then a third high frequency peak, F1, F2, and F3. So what I'm trying to say is that you know, uh, if you know now how to relate the position of these peaks, you also know how to tell from the gravitational wave signal what is the equation of state. Okay? Now you may say, well, now we have seen a signal, then you can tell me what is the equation of state. Unfortunately not. We haven't seen the signal. The signal we have seen, uh, let me go back here. The signal we have seen stopped right here. It stopped right before the interesting part for me. That's because this part of the signal is at a very high frequency, where the detectors are not sensitive. And so we just need, you know, more, more signals, hoping that we, we will see one uh, sufficiently close that we can see that part of the signal. Okay. Um, let me tell you about electromagnetic counterparts. So when two neutral stars merge, very differently from black holes, black holes are made of, of nothing, of vacuum. When they merge, because they merge in a system that do not have, does not have matter, at least we don't think there's going to be a lot of matter, you take two vacua, vacua and you collide them, you will just produce another vacuum, but not electromagnetic radiation. However, already in the 70s, astronomers realized that there are gamma ray flashes coming from outer space. The way they were realizing this is that there was in the 60s, there was the Cold War, and there was a, a, a ban from performing nuclear tests. And there was, you know, the two blocks. The Americans did not trust the, 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 the Soviet Union that they would not test um, you know, atomic, atomic explosions. And so what they did is they launched a secret satellite that would over um, on top of the Soviet Union and would look for gamma rays. When you produce an explosion, a nuclear explosion, you produce gamma rays. And so by just looking at whether or not you would get flashes of gamma rays from the Soviet Union, you would be able to tell whether or not they were following the ban or not. As it happens, the satellite 
was not as in recorded a single flash of, of gamma rays from the Soviet Union, but was recording a lot of flashes from outer space. And that's when people, when this information was uh, released, astronomers jumped on it and immediately produced <coughs> satellites that would actually look at gamma rays not from the Earth but from the sky. And that's when gamma ray bursts were first seen. So, for about 40 years, we've been observing almost daily these flashes of light. You calculate, because they come from the furthest corner of the universe, you can calculate what is the energy, and the numbers are just mind boggling 10 to the 50, 10 to the 53 Earth. What is it we know? Well, we know that there are two classes of them. One is called long and the other one is called short. Well, it's not much of the information. Um, the long lasts about 10 seconds, and we think they have to do with the death of stars. A bit like a supernova, <laughs> but more powerful. The short ones, it's much harder to explain because, you know, the time scale is too short to be explained with a collapse of, of a single star. But, and that's because they last less than a second. However, binary neutron stars merger, the one I was just showing you, does last less than a second. And so, already early on in the 70s, people thought, okay, gamma, short gamma ray bursts are produced by the merger of neutron stars. And this has been an hypothesis up until October of this year. However, there's still a problem in explaining this. Um, how do you produce a jet? We know that these, these, these gamma ray bursts most likely have a, a, a jet, so a, a beam of plasma, which is the one pointing at us. How do, you produce, how do you take two stars, you merge them, and you produce a jet? So again, uh, in order to answer this question, you need to use supercomputers and Einstein's equations together with those of, of plasma dynamics. Um, this is an example of a simulation of, that, of this type. Here you have two stars, and I'm showing two quantities here. One is the magnetic field in blue, and the other one is the, uh, the density in, in orange. You have to imagine that there is a wall, and on, on one side of the wall I'm showing one quantity, and on the other side I'm showing uh, uh, the different quantity. So it's the same binary, um, and this is what happens when they merge. They produce a huge wind of material, uh, it looks like an, 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 an atomic explosion, and then um, so again, this is magnetic field and this is uh, density. At this point, I don't know if you can see, but there is a black hole which is produced. Okay? So this is pretty much the same as what I've shown you in the absence of magnetic field. Um, if you want to, to look at what this looks like in terms of magnetic field lines, this is what happens. You have this magnetic field inside the stars, they merge and they are still having these magnetic fields ordered, then there is the upper mass neutron star which just steers all of this magnetic field producing a big mass of magnetic field. Um, but then you can continue the simulation and let's see what happens. And what happens is essentially shown in this, in this simulation. So for some time, nothing much really happens. But then the system kind of organizes itself. The magnetic field becomes extremely strong. That's because you are just uh, winding up the magnetic field. But it becomes so large that it becomes wide. And so outside of the range, here, and you can see there is a structure over here. There is a magnetic structure which is formed by the matter falling onto the black hole. This is not a static uh, structure, but if you look at it in terms of magnetic field lines again, this is the hyper mass neutron star, then there is a black hole which is formed, and if you wait long enough, you produce this, this magnetic structure. So these calculations were done. Uh, Potsdam about uh, a few years back, and they were the first ones showing that actually, if you want to produce a jet, what you really need is to have two neutron stars with a magnetic field. This is not the end of the story, and this is not the most sophisticated simulation that we can do nowadays, but it is the first one that showed that this is possible. And if you look at, at, at the you know, back of the envelope calculation of what are the time scales, this matches what you would expect from a gamma ray burst. I'm showing you some snapshot of the magnetic field, so you can appreciate what a magnetic field looks like. This is the upper mass neutron star, it's just a mass, a spaghetti ball of magnetic field. Then a black hole is formed, and this black hole is rotating. And so my material has to rotate uh, in a certain direction, and the magnetic field is organized accordingly. And if you wait long enough, you produce uh, 
this, this structure. So it's interesting how the formation of a black hole produces out of a chaotic system like the upper mass neutron star actually a normal system. So if you want to put some order in a place, just put in a black hole and, and you will get the order, especially if it is rotating. Um, I want to maybe take up the last few minutes to talk about the last important aspect of burning neutron stars, which is uh, the nucleosynthesis, the fact that there is ejected matter. So again, you know, already they, al they already had discovered and predicted everything. Already in the 50s, people had worked out what are the nuclear yields of stellar evolution. So they already studied, okay, given a star with a given temperature and composition, what are the elements which are produced, okay? And they had found out that every element cannot be produced in stellar interiors, so something like <coughs> heavier than iron cannot be produced in stellar interior, but they can produce, be produced in a supernova explosion. When you have a supernova explosion, there are nuclear reactions that take place. If you do this calculation nowadays with more sophisticated modeling, you find out that uh, if you have very heavy elements, that is, elements which have an atomic number, A, which is larger than 120, uh, you cannot produce them. Well, you can produce them, but not enough to explain abundances we, we observe. So, most of the other elements cannot be produced by, by supernova. That's because in order to produce this, you really need material which is very hot and which is already neutron rich. And supernova do not have material which is so, because they, they yet have to produce a, a neutron star. But if you have two neutron stars merging, then you already have, you're starting with the, right, with the right setup. You already have a lot of neutron rich material, and so it's easier for you to produce very heavy elements. So, neutron star merges seem the perfect match for explaining this, at least conceptually. You have to work it out. So, I'm showing you now what happens um, to the matter in this other animation here. I'm showing you projection of the density on the three main planes. And I'm just cutting out in spiral so you can see just the upper mass neutron star being produced. Now I will zoom out and I will sprinkle a little bit of particles into the system. These are blue, sorry, they are red or green according to whether they are bound or unbound. And this is what happens to, so when two neutron stars merge, you know, although the movies didn't show you this before, a lot of material is ejected. So this is low density, neutron rich material that is leaving the system. It's just too energetic. It will uh, cool and expand as it goes out. And, um, and then you, know, you can take those little particles that you have sprinkled around and then you can compute things. You can compute what is a nucleosynthesis. You can put into nuclear reaction networks that are complicated uh, codes that calculate all the possible transformation that this matter will go, undergo, and, uh, and you find out that there is a very good match. This is shown in, in this plot over here. So this is the mass number I was mentioning. Gold is over here, 197. This is europium. Uh, I'm not sure, this is lanthanide. And uh, the dots are the chemical abundance that we measure from the solar system. And the, the lines, never mind this type of line, represent the result of these simulations I was mentioning. So you can see there is a very good match between what uh, we observe and what comes out from neutron stars. So if you want to put this in terms of numbers, you may think, okay, how much mass is actually lost in, the, in this process? It's not a lot. It's about 1% of a solar mass. So you know, this is just a tiny fraction of the system mass. But this is a, a lot in, in absolute terms. In fact, this first detection that I was mentioning, GW 170717, has produced 16,000 times the mass of the Earth in every element. And just about 10 Earth masses in gold and platinum. Okay? So just imagine two stars merging and produce so much gold. Of course, you know, this is not. They, don't, they didn't produce a planet of gold, they produced a, a planet equivalent. So, um, the bottom line is that, you know, we, we, were, we were told that we are so stellar dust. Actually, we're not just stellar dust, we are also neutron star dust. Okay. There is another interesting phenomenon that happens when, when binary neutron stars merge, and that's what is called a kilonova emission. 
this sprinkling, these little particles that are emitted, this matter which is uh, lost, actually undergoes now uh, nucleosynthesis, as I was mentioning, as it expands and cools, but also below a certain density and below a certain temperature, it will decay radioactively. And when it does so, it will emit light. Light in the uh, in bands like the infrared or the optical. This is again something that was predicted uh, some time ago by Lee Francesca, and it's called the Kilo Nova. So, uh, when two neutron stars merge, you see them immediately in the gravitational wave, then you wait a bit, an hour, a, a day or so, and you will start seeing an object in the sky appearing in the optical. That's what our simulations tell you. you know, this is the amplitude the magnitude of the luminosity of the system, you see that has a peak around about a, a day, and this is the, the actual observational data. Okay. So this is a very important piece of information. You may not appreciate this, because this is really what tells you what kind of closes the circles. If, I, if you remember, I said that already in, in the 70s, people thought neutron stars are producing sh short gamma ray bursts. This is the evidence that this is exactly the, same, the, the, the case. Because we've seen gravitational waves from burning neutron stars, and we've seen a kilonova. And we know that kilonova is associated to gamma ray bursts. So we have seen burning neutron star mergers and a gamma ray burst. So the two are the very same thing. OK. Um, out of two minutes, let me just uh, remind and recall what is it that I've explained to you. Um, Arguably, binary neutron stars are the richest laboratory that Einstein could ever dream of. He didn't know anything about them, but they have, they combine extreme gravity, extreme state of matter, extreme electrodynamics. In order to, uh, to explore these objects, you need advanced mathematical methods, numerical techniques, and of course, the power, the brute pow power of supercomputers. If you can get gravitational waves from this system, you can learn a lot. And already, a single detection has told us a lot about the equation of state and the masses of these objects. So I think the bottom line is that working in this area has never been as exciting, and I hope to be seeing many more detections in, in the, the new year. Thank you for your attention. That's a good question. Um, most of it will end up into the black hole, but part of it will also be radiated. The problem is that this radiated energy will impinge onto the messy matter that is outside of the binary system, and so most likely will be absorbed by the matter and you will not see it. However, there are there is a possibility where this very process, you take a star, a neutron star, which has a large magnetic field, which is alone, isolated, and essentially in vacuum, and collapses to a black hole. When this happens, then this emission of, of electromagnetic radiation will just propagate, will not be absorbed by anything. <coughs> and this idea is called a blitzer. And this blitzer model may explain what has been discovered uh, over the last couple of years, which is maybe the, mo the most interesting <coughs> discovery in, in astro uh, astronomy, which is are called fast radio bursts. These are radio signals which are very short, a millisecond, which come from wo all over the sky and which do not repeat apart from one. And we don't really know what, what, what they are. And could be one of these one of these processes. So the answer to your question is yes, you can release the, the, this energy in the magnetic field, but it might either be absorbed if there is matter around or not if there is vacuum. Thank you very much for this great talk. I just wonder, and, uh, has it been estimated up to high energies that it is possible to accelerate particles during the motion of the star? So, um, Oh, uh, I don't think I know the answer to this. Uh, um, but the, the typical temperatures of, of, of these objects are the order of 100 MeV. And uh, 
you know, depending, the acceleration will depend a lot on, 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 on the magnetic field configuration. So you, you might have charged particles being accelerated to, to, to much larger energies than that, maybe, you know, thousands of GeV. In fact, uh, although there is no clear connection between cosmic rays and neutron stars, we do think that a lot of the most energetic cosmic rays are produced by binary mergers. I was interested in your mechanism for the formation of the jets from the, the binaries. Yep. Would, would that hold up at the supermassive scale as well, or centers of the galaxies? No, no. Um, well, I don't know, <laughs> actually. I don't know. Um, our, our simulations are way too crude to explain, uh, you know, what is the, the, the actual acceleration mechanism. Also, I haven't produced quite a jet. Uh, let me be clear. What I've shown you is that you have a, a magnetic field structure, which is, is like a jet. But if you look at the, you know, the, the, whether or not there is an outflow of matter, which is what you would expect in a jet, we don't produce an outflow yet in our simulations. So what you can think of is that I have produced a pipe, but I haven't produced a flow in the pipe. And uh, in, in, in supermassive black holes, we also don't know what produces these jets and could either be a, a generativistic effect near the black hole or could be a global motion of the magnetic field. So uh, I would say the, the, this is still an open question and certainly something we haven't addressed with our simulations. Yes, that's what I tell my students. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I think, you know, this is really a new window on the universe. will allow us to see things that we haven't seen before. And uh, with a bit of luck, because, you know, this is astronomy, you, 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 you have to get the signal and you cannot predict when the signal will come, uh, we will see a lot of interesting phenomena. And maybe, you know, so what we've seen so far is what we expected. I hope that we know we're going to see something we didn't expect, and maybe something that you know really shakes Einstein theory. So far, Einstein theory explains everything perfectly, but it's not the only theory that explains everything perfectly. That's because the uncertainty is still very large. Can I ask you a couple of very simple questions? Sure. I think you did say to us, maybe I misunderstood, that you didn't know uh, what a black hole was made of, and I think you also said you didn't know what a neutron. Uh, did, I, did I understand you correctly? Just in the second part. We do know what, is, what a black hole is made of. It's made of nothing. It's a bit hard for me to accept. Right. <laughs> well, the point is that, you know, mathematically, a black hole is a solution in vacuum of the Einstein's equations. If you remember the Einstein's equation, I've written G equal T. Well, in order to get a black hole solution, you have to set t equal to zero. That's vacuum. So you can have um, a solution of the Einstein's equation which produces a given gravitational field, and yet is made of nothing. So don't forget, Einstein is saying it's just a matter of curvature. It doesn't have to be a curvature produced by an object. It can be just a curvature because there is an infinitesimally, sorry, an infinitely large density in a, in a, in a single point. So the reason why you find this difficult to accept is that you, know, you are hinting to one of the most significant difficulties of Einstein theory. That is, that it cannot explain microscopical uh, scales. What happens at the very center of a black hole is not known. There is a singularity. The classical theory just says there is a singularity. Everything diverges. All the, all the laws of physics break down. We know, well, we find it's very hard to accept. And so we need a, a theory which describes these very small scales. And maybe when we are able to look at very small scales, then we can say, okay, a black hole is actually is not made of, of vacuum, but it's made of a very high concentration of energy that we can't really describe yet. This is called quantum gravity theory, which we don't have yet. So are you, are you, are you saying then that uh, Einstein's theory simply takes you to that point, but can't go exactly, further, yes, exactly. and that you're waiting, it seems yes, very exciting because you're waiting for something to explain what is 
there. Yes, indeed. Although you know, explaining what's in there might not become might not become evident from gravitational wave observation because what's inside a black hole stays inside a black hole. We, it's covered by an horizon, and this horizon is a membrane that doesn't allow you to, 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 to look in. About a second part, it's true. We don't know what neutron stars are made of. We just know roughly what they're made of. But if you ask me, OK, drill a hole, and stop at one kilometer from the surface, and t tell me what's in there, I wouldn't know. Well, I would have a lot of answers, but I wouldn't know what is the right answer. OK, then, yeah. So is it untrue and a gross over, uh, simplification to say that neutron stars are composed more than 99% of neutrons? Like, if you often come across that? Uh, no, no, I think it, it is, you know, well, certainly if you, if you look at the, uh, the composition is a function of, of, of position, OK? And if you go at a certain position in the star, then essentially it's neutrons. But if you are, in the outer layer, what is called the crust, then you will have there a lot of electrons. If you go further in, maybe there's going to be even quarks, you know, free quarks. So, you know, neutron star is a very you know, generic description, but we don't really know what, what is inside these objects. And that what makes them so, so interesting. So what I'm, what I'm, you know, the, the fact that two objects will uh, get closer to each other is if the system is, is not influenced by anything else. It's just a binary system of two objects. Then the system can only you know, uh, decrease the separation. But the solar system had a very complicated li earlier life. And maybe the moon was closer, but then was pulled out by the fact that we had other planets in the system. So if you take two objects, they will radiate and lose energy, and they will get closer to each other. I think there was a, a question over there. So a neutron star, right, it's initially made of atoms. It is also eventually made of okay. atoms. Yeah. So do the atoms get mangled up or broken apart when they enter into a neutron star? Is that why you don't know what's in it? Yeah, so that's a very good I question. I think, you know. You, you have to think that you know, normally when we have an atomic description, we think of a nucleus, an electron at far distance, and then inside the nucleus there are um, the nuclei have a certain separation. When you, this picture is completely changed inside a neutron star. Essentially, the mean separation of particles is of the same size as the particles themselves. So the nucleons are extremely <coughs> compactified, um, and the separation is extremely small. And it's very hard for us to come up with descriptions because we cannot produce such matter on Earth. What we can do is we can take two objects, collide them, crash them, and then try to understand what happens when you, know, you have a very large number of them all being compact, compactified. So it's, it's, you know, I think you should just stop thinking about the little particles as, 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 as balls uh, and, and have a certain separation. It's, it's, a, it's a much more complex continuum, which you know, is very hard from a nuclear physics point of view to describe. And they're being broken apart because of the weight? Is the yeah, because essentially you know, they, 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 they have to, to, to coexist to very, very close distances. So electrons are just pulled out. They cannot be in this, uh, in this sea. Washed out by all the nucleuses getting together. Yes. And actually, this is what, you know, it's this compactification that produces, that sets a limit to, uh, I, was, I was explaining that a supernova is when the iron core co contracts and at one point just stops. It cannot be contracted any further. That's because you reach a separation among particles that, you know, you cannot go beyond. And this then bat sends a shock wave and, and, and a supernova explosion. <coughs> One more, uh, in your simulation, have you ever created a charge black hole? Or uh -huh. Yes, I have. Uh, 
but I'm not sure that it is realistic. I mean, you can produce a charged black hole, and that's because um, I studied from a, a star which was, had already had a charge. That type of black hole is known as a Kerr-Newman black hole. It's a rotating charged black hole. And uh, you can produce it. But astrophysically, you would think that as soon as you produce one of those, all the particles that are there, there are free particles of one, ch of one sign, will say, hey, look, there is a huge charge there. Let's go and neutralize it. And if you calculate with the time scale for this to happen, it's very rapid. So we don't think that charged black holes exist. You can produce them but very quickly they will be neutralized. Okay. So oh, there's another question. <laughs> <laughs> very beautiful uh, looking simulations. Um, how do you go about writing the code and validating it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Are you a referee of my paper? <laughs> OK, so yeah, that's a very good question. Um, we very, very. Um, careful that the results we present are correct. And there are ways of convincing ourselves that they are correct. There are theorems that tell you that if you have implemented your equations correctly, then your results should scale with the properties of the system, in particular with the resolution. Any of these simulations require a certain grid and spacing, and you know that if you increase or decrease the spacing, then the error in your solution has to, be, has to be smaller. And has to be smaller at a precise rate. This is called convergence study, and we are very meticulous in making these, com these uh, convergence studies. Now, we don't always do convergence studies because they are very expensive. And so sometimes what we do is we cross compare with colleagues. We take the same system, and with different codes, we simulate and get some answer. And then we compare the answer, and we convince ourselves that this is the right answer because they, combine, they, they, they coincide. But it's a very important point. Besides, we get observations. Finally, you know, we get observations, and observations confirm that what we have done is correct. Is there evidence for a graviton in all of this? There isn't an evidence, but I don't think this, you know, this excludes the idea either. So um, I think you know, the, the, if you come from, from particle physics, the idea of gravity is still a, a very interesting and, and worth pursuing one, but right now there isn't evidence for this. And what we know is that whatever, what we certainly know is that if it is, it's moving at the speed of light to a very good position. Okay. So thank you very much again.